that's why I felt like I'd rather sit down with someone of your stature to really correct me. So I believe more than saying I'm sorry, which I am, I'm 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 sorry for causing pain, hurt to people. But I need to learn how not to do that anymore. Right. And uh, that's why I appreciate this discourse. You, we, we've already talking, but we're going we're gonna to get to it. So then yeah. why, how is it that I sent out? Because I wrote that tweet. Yeah, I me. know you did. It was me. <laughs> it okay, was... I'm pretty quick. I don't, by the way, I don't have my own Twitter account yeah. or any. But, we're, we're, you know, when I saw it, I watched the piece. And I, when I heard from someone, and uh, with my apologies, because I didn't know you, but my daughter in Jerusalem called me this morning. Right. And my nephew from New Jersey uh, called me on the way over. The world knows you. Right, right. Okay. Um, Tell him I said what's up. When, <laughs> when, when, I, when I watched the piece and uh, there was somebody there who was saying, uh, I'm not even a real Jew. Right. That, that goes right to the heart. And I also knew that these themes, Rothschild, all the conspiracies and stuff, Right. It's pure Farrakhan. And there there were two generations. Griff, who it turns out I yeah. had something to do with a generation ago. Yeah, we got to get into that as well. And a younger, better looking guy just <laughs> parroting the old Farrakhan lines. Now and I understand exactly that for many people in the black community, when they hear Farrakhan they think of Million Man March. Indeed. They think about black empowerment. Leadership. They think about leadership. They think about one of the greatest orators in America, which is true. Very true. What we think about uh, Farrakhan is a person who has invested a lot of his energies in the hatred of the Jewish people, who's insulted us, said Hitler's a great man, I practice a gutter religion, uh, in some ways really in inexplicable. And this, these are themes that, as I mentioned, he's one of the most honest people in America because he's never changed. He's, these are themes that he brought to Los Angeles uh, in 1984 and in which were repeated very often in his uh, Savior Day speeches you know, uh, 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 across the country. And now with social media platforms reaching more and more of the younger generations. And speaking of the young generation, as someone who's received, you know, several lessons uh whether it's through social media whether it's my own readings my own understanding and that you would maybe perceive as hateful rhetoric or propaganda um was in my mind uh, a process of learning because like you said a lot of people this new generation is the purpose of this platform we've we've heard well we were introduced to new information and you know they if if it's not put clearly, which I even though I know how you could have taken many of the things that I said uh, as hate and propaganda, but if that was never my heart and intentions, but you you, you touched on a, a bunch of things that you just just recently said, and even speaking of the, of the minister, uh, and it, it reminded me of one of the great quotes of like you know if if the surviving lions don't tell their story, then the hunters will get all the glory. So when you speak of great man like Mr. Simon Wiesenthal and or in was perceived in the black community a great man like Louis Farrakhan um, you you personally you said even before we could sit down you know as candidly as possible before we could sit down that you know uh, I must apologize for the hateful things I said and my intentions were I was talking about how amazing black people were uh, but it hurt so many people that weren't a part of that community while I was trying to encourage and uplift my own community and your rebuttal to that and this was just kind of over you know messaging each other was let me send you something uh and you sent me uh nine pages i believe it was of you know s some pretty harsh and, and hateful terminology i didn't hear anything i mean these were words that i was reading and, and i was like i could never condone any of that it was hateful you know demagoguery all, all of those type of things um but even in that i could send you nine pages i could send you 90 pages of wonderful things from my perception from what i was taught 
like you said, that's the only man I know who has ever peacefully brought together a million black men at once for atonement. And when we speak of atonement, yes, this is what we're here for. When, yes. If you know the definition of atonement, to, to right the wrongs of, or, or for anyone that you may have upset or hurt. That's what atonement is. And and I feel like this is a atone, atoning moment. But then I had to go in because I'm not here to protect anyone else or I'll only have this conversation. I'm not even here to protect my name. I don't care. Cancel me 10 more times. You know what I mean? I, I don't care about money. I don't care. I am really care about who I am truly. And knowing that if I hurt someone, I have to correct that. I, I was taught that. I, it's, I'm just that certain. I, first, I must apologize. But tell me how I hurt you. Because I can't just say a blanket, I'm sorry. Uh, but then again, like I said, I self-reflect. And trust me, I had so much reading material, as you see in this up. But I, I got, I just had an opportunity of, of reading this book, the How to Fight um, Anti-Semitism by, I believe, the, the, the young woman's name is Barry Weiss. Yeah, know. she just uh, resigned from the New York Times right, this right. week. Right, right, bar. Yeah, and, but I, as I was reading through it, it's something that stuck out that kind of corrected me and and it, I felt it in my spirit and I think it was something where it says um, ant, anti-Semitism uh, is is fueled uh, through hate or but often um, it, it often like I think it was like the good intentions uh, or the, the misintentions of the good is what perpetuates it right and then I was like, wow, that's that's me. You know what I mean? Because I could that's probably why they thought I was being, you know, anti Semite in that sense. Because I it doesn't matter what my intentions were, it still hurt an entire so, community. You know, part of what's going on here, of course, is uh, a generational difference. Let, let me <laughs> let me explain why. Um, the the notion of self discovery someone who's serious enough to want to look into many different faiths and religions and uh, self-awareness, it's important to someone like you. Um, all of those things, including the, the maybe the discussion that you had with Griff, mm -hmm. he would have had it in a coffee shop or over dinner. That's <laughs> right. one thing. Right. But uh, as we spoke about the feather story, yeah. you're in a totally different uh, level. You're I gotta studying, be responsible for all the feathers that I put out there. Right, you're studying uh, and and discovering in real time. Yes, and of course, what one of the reasons why, uh, and it's tragic, tragic that uh, so many people reacted uh, to what was said in that program is, it's all over social media from other folks with other intentions, and they put it together the way that they want to put it together. I mean, if you could take 90 minutes, people are going to chop this up. People are going to chop what we're talking about right now. Well, can we then, charge them for it? Yeah, I know, right? We get some kind of publishing or residual. <laughs> but it's going to be one of those things where it, you can make any, it's just like our books of faith, that you can make it say whatever you want it to say. Right. So with when we talk about intention, and I remember also when the announcement came about the Million Man March and that the theme would be repentance, a lot of people in the Jewish community hoped and prayed that would be the beginning of a new chapter with Farrakhan. But it, it turned out that it absolutely was not. And the, the, the part of the uh, deep concerns that we have is uh, because he exudes a kind of uh, image of a real leader, uh, courageous, parentheses, doesn't care what the white man says about anything, which is I can, I can uh, relate to people saying, well, I want to hear more from this guy. Right. But uh, on the overall sk stage of things, someone, you know, who went to Libya when Gaddafi was running that show, got $5 million, you know, from him, just recently was in Tehran, in, in Iran, with uh, the Ayatollah's uh, people, uh, you know, who, who are brutal, who throw gays off of uh, apartment house uh, you know, a seventh story. So, and that's the thing, like, because, and that's, I would love to set the table again because I, I know we can. We'll, we, we'll reboot it another way. Just to finish the thought, though, on <laughs> Farrakhan is he sees himself also as a global leader. And more often than not, we see him sort of showing up with folks who really hate America and maybe the idea of America. And 
that's also a source of uh, concern. And that's the thing, I, and that's what, what I wanted to say about just kind of back up and have a bird's eye view of even what we're discussing. When you say the words hate, and this is just my personal beliefs, and as, as a spiritual man, I would think you would probably agree. Um, I believe hate is an energy, uh, and it's, it's very contagious, and it's easily digestible. Um, because it's it's this fire and it's that you know they all they often even say uh, emotions are the enemies of facts uh, yes. it, and because we can get so riled up and it's something even in the moment somebody says something and they curse and people applaud and all of these things and and it takes me back um, to even my own relationship with my father who I said is a, is a minister and has some very very uh, traditional beliefs when it comes to the Bible, uh, to the idea that the, the earth might only be 9,000 years old and, uh, and possibly flat. I, and, or, and even some, you know, because of scripture that they can go to, people's ways of life that they may or may not agree with. And I find myself having discourse with my father daily. Uh, and even if we might be screaming and yelling at each other to the, it leaves so angry. But not one day have I never not loved my father unconditionally. And the only reason why I make that example is because when I look to a patriarch in the black community, and we don't have a lot of leaders, I can count them on my hands. Um, if someone tells me that this person is, I can, you can send me whatever thing you say. If you say, nah, that's, I don't agree with that. What the, my dad said that, nah, I'm not rocking. But I'm not in the position as a human being or as a, as a spirit, you know, embodying this human uniform, this flesh suit I got on. I don't have the power to judge or condemn or throw away any human being. And I only can make my assessments off of what I know and when I think when I think we'll go back we'll, we'll talk about Dr. Martin Luther King who to me was an amazing man Malcolm X these are men, Muhammad Ali amazing men but these are people they you know this country called Martin Luther King the most dangerous Negro in the nation they labeled him as a terrorist and whether he he was for nonviolence, Malcolm X at that time was for violence they were both assassinated so when someone else tells me, someone that I knew since a child, only to be a leader to my community that I not only can't listen, I can't even talk about him. I can't even, I can't stand next to him. I can't take a picture with him. Who am I to believe? If somebody told me that, you know, like I, I, I would be so confused. So um, in that same sense of someone who I know is about loving, understanding, and healing, my question would be, and I've, I've heard the same thing from him, and I would love to hear what you would say, when it comes to atonement, repentance as, as loving spiritual people. You know, I, I've, I've been through these cities, like to say, like South Central LA, Compton, handing out free food, knocking on doors during the times of COVID, giving toilet paper with the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. But I've also, I, I'm, I'm on the board of, uh, of St. Mary's in, in New York, a children's hospital, where my personal friend, a rabbi, we go from room to room, children with cancer. I know beautiful, amazing men who provide, who have completely different walks of life. And I'm like, why can't I get these two groups together to speak? Why, why is there so much division where loving spiritual leaders won't talk to each other. Right, so let me introduce you a little bit to my worldview and how I was born in 1950, that's five years after the end of World War II. Um, during uh, the Nazi period, that's 1933 when Hitler came till 45 when he committed suicide. Right. So the uh, he wasn't really hiding his game plan about Jews, what he thought, he already wrote about it Right. When you come to the Museum of Tolerance, you're going to see uh, something he wrote in 1919 and signed. Mm. So he had the hate built in. Just nobody ever thought back then that he would ever have the power to activate right. his, his worldview. So my traditions, uh, and which are not too much different than the traditions, they certainly have uh, parallels in many similar roots 
of our parents and grandparents. Yeah, it's all right. Abrahamic. It's all, right. you know, we, we right. all respect the Torah. And, and we hope that Abraham is always forgiving us. <laughs> we hope. For, for giving him a bad name. But uh, we do hate evil. Evil is real power, and we do hate evil. We don't condone it. There are those whose religious faith and or their spiritual approaches. No, you can't hate anything because it's going to no. It's going to drive out darkness with light. Yeah, it's going to consume it. Right. But there are some times when you're confronted with absolute evil that you have to be lucky enough that uh, Kareem's uh, father's best friend, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right. In, it burst into a, a Nazi concentration camp in 1945 and, and, saved, people. and saved some people who a few days later would have been dead uh, anyway from starvation. So the point is, yes, we have to love humanity. Heck, we're, if you see Genesis, our approach is we are each uh, uh, created in the image of God, as you know a little bit of Hebrew, yeah. Selem Elohim. Yeah. Okay. Then there's another uh, line, and you know we might threaten to give the Talmud a good name here. Yeah. Uh, the Talmud uh, teaches, "Kashem she parts of fehem shonim shonot kach deotehem shonim." Okay. Which means panim is face. Just as no two faces are alike, no two people think exactly alike. That's true. And I, I, since you know, I don't know, I'm gonna shout myself. I'll give myself I, I, a Hebrew thing. I know Azel Haham Halomed. Mikol Adam, Adam excellent. means all people. If you're, if you're, all the wise men must learn from all people. That's correct. So I, I believe in that. So while we're sitting here, to, and that's even in, in that question what that I Mr. posed. Mr. Wiesenthal uh, taught me some in, interesting things. But I think only someone who went through it could sort of set those uh, markers down uh, because he refused to be consumed by hate. His focus was justice and he invested a lot of time and a lot of trust in the new generation that was coming up in Germany and there were times I was with him he'd be in an airport somebody who is really white <laughs> okay, I mean really really white an Aryan you know come over with a they go get mad at you for saying a that, piece, piece of paper <laughs> and we give the paper to Mr. Wiesenthal because everybody in Europe knew him then and right. he said this is the name and date of birth of my father or grandfather or older brother. They won't tell me what they did in World War II. Can you please check it out and let me know? That was the kind of symbol that Mr. Wiesenthal be became to a lot of young people, mm. young Germans. Right. So uh, he, he his humanity was limitless. But as someone who had experienced the ultimate evil, uh, you know, people, he wrote a book you got to read it called The Sunflower. Sunflower. Okay, there are a couple of different editions. The the newer one has, uh, you could probably teach the course eventually on The Sunflower because it's about everything we talked about yesterday. Right. It's a real story. Mr. Wiesenthal was in six camps during mm -hmm. the war. I think this was in the fourth one. And uh, one day he was called out of line. We call the appell, you're lined up. You can stand there for hours. The Nazis did it just, you know, to torture people. Right. And That's they horrible. took him and they brought him into a field full of sunflowers. There was a field hospital, big tent. He goes into a tent and there is uh, someone who's dying of their injuries. Turns out it's an SS officer. And he said, I want to see a Jew. I want to confess and I want to be... Um, I, I want someone who's Jewish to accept my apologies for what I did before I go to the next world. I want to clear the... And he told Mr. We they brought in Simon. He wow. was shocked. He figured, you didn't know, maybe they'd take him in the tent to shoot him or whatever. Right. And he was, he was um, asked, um, will you forgive him? Wow. And um, the book stops there, and then he asks religious spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama and others, right, right. what would you say? Mm. What would you say to someone who asks you that question? What would Mr. you say? You're asking me? I was born in Brooklyn. So. <laughs> I, I think what I would say is the following. Whatever it is that you did to me, um, I have the obligation at least to think, especially if it's a capital crime, not... Mm -hmm. um, 
I have the, if it's in me to quote unquote forgive you, maybe. But for what you did to six million people, mm. I don't have the power. It's pure evil. To, I don't have the power to forgive you for what happened to someone else. Mm. I'm not, uh, whether it's a rabbi, it can be a real rabbi, you know, who's, who looks the role. It can be a great scholar. At the end of the day, I think Judaism's approach on this issue is, in terms of what happens to you, you're you're in the situation to deal with that directly. But what's done to others, you don't have the moral right to forgive what happened to someone else. Right. That's I can hear that. And so, that, that I think that would kind of you know and Simon counter Simon's what response. I, what I was saying, I don't have the power to judge right. either. Right. So Simon, well, but that's different. Right. If you have absolute evil, there's an obligation to judge. Not the power to, there's an obligation to judge. Why? Because people can misconstrue that if I don't have the uh, the power to judge, then you don't you sort of like uh, deflect right. the, the those difficult decisions because we all agree right. that when you're confronted with evil in the world, I mean, every kind of evil act, it, it, it uh, destroys the Tselem Elohim. Right. It destroys the concept it's that, you know, each person, uh, we've come to understand. God in all of us. Ha, a, a, that how, what, and I think God must have a great sense of humor as well, <laughs> and I hope a very slow fuse. But right. our, our theological approach, or the way I was taught, was that every person born to this planet has uh, free, free choice, free will, to act how they decide to act. They're going to be influenced by the kind of parents, the neighbors, their gang, etc. Yeah. But at at the core, everybody has the right and the and the freedom to choose how to act. Right. Okay? And everyone has an obligation then to take responsibility right. for their actions. I agree, and this is why I agree with you. And because you said you said a lot just now, and I, I, would, I would love to unpack it. Uh, but one thing that stood out um, is it said, "We hate evil." And I, I can agree with that. I can, you know, even, even whether it's Christian beliefs or Sikhism or, you know, we're like, oh, we we're going to just shower everything with love or drown our darkness with light. But, right. but when something is absolutely evil, demonic, uh, the darkest of the dark forces, the only way to defeat it is with the strength of love from each other, but it has to be with a great. It, it has to be with a, a warrior spirit. So let, let me let me so, pick up on that if yeah, I can, because yeah. you're right. So you know, I do a lot of traveling in the yeah. Arab and Muslim world, right, right. which is really interesting. That could be an, another private no, conversation. Wait, that. We'll, we'll do that in the next session. But that we what? Have. But what's interesting. Uh, especially in the Gulf, but I've been to Indonesia, even Sudan. In fact, I'm going to be going back to Sudan if they ever let me fly again. <laughs> they will. Uh, you know, what's interesting Who's is they? in uh, well, <laughs> means they is my boss, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> That's simple enough. That's very okay? simple. I use There's the no royal. I, I, I use the royal they. <laughs> right. So the, the interesting thing is because this. Uh, uh, I don't think we'd be going in this direction, but it's an interesting question and an interesting point. People respect strength, not necessarily always military strength. It could be moral, it could be economic. People respond to strength. They do. Now, in, in the, the love changes that are going on in the Arab world because of yeah. Iran and other things and the, the uh, Arab uh, Spring and, and uh, social media, you, a lot of things roiling. I don't think it's because of my good looks that I have opportunities to spend time with people. Looking, it might be. Uh, yeah. You know, I can't believe it. <laughs> you yeah, know, with a sh I'm, with, I'm at one of those Shia <laughs> meetings where, you know, and I'm sitting next to the main guy and I'm wearing my, my kippah in, in a place like Bahrain. Quite interesting. Right. So the point being is that if you're strong, I'm not saying it personally, mm -hmm. their perception is, oh, well, he's a Zionist, which means probably the Israeli sent him anyway. Or and he knows people in Washington, so he's a really connected Jew. He's got a lot of power. Those power, are, those like are, that, blah, those blah, are blah, stereotypes, blah. right? Yes. So, so, but I sometimes will leverage that in places like that because I don't have an end game. My end game is let's make sure that the kids 
have a curriculum that teaches mutual respect, et cetera. Education. I'm not a businessman, so I'm not looking for a couple of oil contracts. <laughs> right. I'm an anomaly. I'm coming to these meetings. I'm asking, essentially, for nothing except I'll sit down with anybody who's ready to respect me. But here's the point. If we want to promote uh, and teach uh, tolerance and mutual respect, what's really interesting is that if you enter from a position of strength, not of arrogance, of strength, there's a lot of interesting things that will happen. If you walk into the lion's dens, and there are many you mentioned before about a, a lion, yeah. you walk into that lion's den and the perception is you're weak, you have you zero yeah. opportunity to impact. You are, that's why I say you want the lion's share of the meal. <laughs> I understand. Uh, I definitely agree with you. It, but it, it just goes to a place, honestly. And, and, and only, only wanted to highlight that aspect because, like you said, with strength, with, you know, it's that psychological concept with love and fear. Fear comes reverence. And in that reverence, that's how you gain respect for your community. And then that's even where we got into a lot of that conversation with Griff and I was actually having about the idea of ownership and and utilizing your strength and utilizing your position to get as much as you wish for and that to me is a supremacy quality or I don't quality a su supremacy method uh and that to me when you when I heard you say we hate evil I as and this was never supposed to be a conversation right. about comparing oppression because we know as we sit across from each other we both come from communities that have been oppressed and just slaughtered and and if there's a commonality that we could say so we there's no need to uh, that, that's could, that's given and there are plenty of places we can walk into into the United States where people will smile at you right but may not exactly think, oh, wow. They, they're they not that. even thinking about that. We, but get, we, but we, we get two for the price of yeah, one. Our commonality, <laughs> right, indeed. Our commonality is that we are a people of oppression. So that's why instead of, you know, I don't know where the energy came from for to divide us, but we should be allies because of our common oppression. So to say all of that, when you said, I hate evil, like, I feel you, I hate evil too, because I feel like, and, and I will take the word evil, and say another term in which the term I feel like I was the only thing I was discussing with Griff is white supremacy. I hate white supremacy. I will never apologize for saying I hate white supremacy. If there's only if there's probably one thing where I say, oh, I love everybody, man, I love I hate white supremacy. And if there's somebody who wants to cancel me for that, so be it. I don't need your money. I don't need you. I don't care. Uh, and even if, you know, for whatever reason, because I don't want to take anybody. Into so, all, I'll take out the word white, if you would like. So, I no, no, it's blue fine. blue supremacy. Let, let, me, let hate, me ask you. Uh, polka dot what, supremacy. What, do you, what did ML King say about that? He think? said, when evil men plot, good men plan. Right. Right. Means you have to confront the evil, not, not deflect it. And, and ML King... In my who they, humble who opinion, they kill. yes, but in my white humble, supremacy. In my in my humble opinion, M. L. King looked at the what looked like an even bleaker situation back then. Okay, he hated the evil. Yes, and I think the way what what inspired me about him and still does to this day is he figured out something really important about America, at least its potential which is if you can figure out a way to awaken the conscience of people to help defeat racism, not by saying it doesn't exist or making believe we don't look differently, but if you can come up with coalition, you might actually win the day. And that's not a message a lot of people are hearing today. We talked about this in our phone conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Farrakhan's, if you will, of the world. It's all a matter, the lens is race. For Martin Luther King, the lens was different, meaning, to again, make it clear, I don't need to teach you about the reality of racism. You can be the most, and maybe you will someday be the most spectacularly successful black man in America. I'll receive be, it. Okay, you'll, <laughs> you'll get it, but 
that doesn't mean you'll be hated any less. Maybe you'll be hated more. No, they more still, they, they because, still, everybody's because, mad at you right now. Because racism is a part it's of It's real. It. it is real. It's institutionalized. We, that's also a, could be a, 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 long, a long discussion. My point on the human level is the following. What did ML King, what was his exit strategy? What's his vision? What was the man's vision for America? It's, today it sounds like revolutionary. And since he paid with his life, we, we can say that he wasn't very Pollyannish. He understood better than we understood in real time what he was up against, he FBI he's, he's, and all the rest of I it. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with right. you. Right. But he said also, I'm hoping, I'm working, I'm praying for the day that there'll be a time in America when you will be judged based on the quality of your character and not the, the color, color of your, of your skin. skin. I'm waiting for that day still. No, no, that's not a good answer. <laughs> and you got to work for that day. But he also said that was his dream, but he, a few years later he said his dream turned into a nightmare because he realized that it was more about capitalism than the color. It was more about the poor and the hierarchy. And I feel like that's where we get into those conversations about, well, why is it that this infrastructure of white supremacy, the, this institutionalized racism where black people are perceived as property and second-class citizens and just have to daily prove to this day, not, you, we can go to the, all of the museums and, and see all of our oppression, but currently I can go outside and watch black men be oppressed. We, we can currently, whether we're seeking the justice of Breonna Taylor, uh, uh, George Floyd, I stood in the spot where George Floyd was murdered and, and my spirit shook just based off of this is still happening. We, we, need, we need positive energy, we need love, we need healing immediately. So you're my brother. So this conversation, I'm like, yo, this, no, like, okay, well, I will apologize. I'm sorry, because that's not the messaging. Even when I'm speaking to someone like a Griffin, you know, we all have radical friends and things. And we, you know, this is what this forum is for, to have difficult conversations. And some people are going to say some things. And even if I'm nodding, yeah, yeah, because I've read the books they've read. I, I know the things, even as we're, we're talking back and forth and, you know, Joking in Hebrew, like, because there's a commonality uh, and an appreciation and a respect. But when you get to a place of where, like you said, I may not understand everything you know, and you may not understand everything I know, but as a student, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen because I feel like that's how we grow together as a community. Right. So, um, so just w w what's interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm listening very carefully to, to what you're saying, and maybe... And I'm not going to compare you to M.L. King. Nobody can No, please, him. please but don't. You're, you're, <laughs> you're of another generation, and with all due respect, I, I think you're an interesting role model to show people how you could use capitalism. Capitalism has been very good. To me. To you, <laughs> right? Yes, so, yes it has. <laughs> so maybe, and of course, uh, thank God, there are, there are so many... And the increasing, you know, successful African American business people built yeah. empires. And we et coming together. We learn. We learning from right. your community. Right. Like, that's it. And Teach that, me your ways, Rabbi. That, that's uh, and I'm always open to learn. But when I look at Simon and I look at the survivors who are now leaving the world stage, you know, every mm -hmm. day we're we're losing them. Um, uh, they taught me two things. First of all, they they taught me to hate evil. Mm -hmm. And number two, they taught me to embrace humanity and hope. Because if it. they were able to bring kids into the world after what they saw, right. and Ooh, you know, you make a great that's point. like so empowering. But this, the, the, um, again, if, if you go back, you know, it, it's uh, very frustrating for American Jewry. Why? Because when they look back at Selma, forget about the movie where they took the rabbi out. Right. But... Uh, that day in Selma, right? There was a, a there was a rabbi. There was, there. A there, was rabbi, a, there was many people from the Jewish a, community who doing was, the civil rights. I've but, always stated no, no, that. But that rabbi experienced Hitler mm. and escaped Germany in time, and then came over and fought. And with came us. over, so he didn't need an engraved invitation. Hundred percent. He right. saw the injustice, and he showed up. 
and that's why we are brothers and members of the community. And I, didn't, I, I the, the one point I was making when I was talking about this definitely isn't a comparison of oppression, but the, the same way that George Floyd, we can go outside. Let's not forget, and I'm, I'm aware, and I, and I love this book because it, it details from a perspective uh, from a, a young Jewish woman that not a few years ago, uh, you know, a the energy of white supremacy entered a, a Pennsylvania synagogue and killed 11 people. Uh, last year, a 19-year-old white supremacist spirit yes. in San Diego, moments from here, went in and shot up a, a synagogue and killed members of the of the yeah he the, killed the sister one of our members of our synagogue in L.A. So it it hurts very so so and you have there's also pain amongst us you have New Zealand the, right the mosques that were the murders that were broadcast on uh, on social media yeah in and real I time. and so I understand when you hear things that sound like rhetoric that are reminiscent of the Holocaust or reminiscent of stereotypes that make people want to ostracize. Uh, your your faith. I understand why that's painful. I understand why that's hurtful, and that is never my intentions. But I do. My intentions are to speak truth and truth to power, because this, if this is a conversation of truth and reconciliation, we can't get caught up in who was oppressed the most. We can't get caught up in you can't say that or you can't do this or well the blacks have this. Well this we. we that's not this conversation. If this is a conversation of true healing and understanding, we got to say we're together. And even that conversation of being one, because ultimately that's just what I was trying to get to that idea of, because I gave my friend Griff the opportunity because oh, for 30 years, he believes that he has been blackballed from entertainment. And my first question was, why? What ha What did you say that not even 30 years can get you back to where you need to get to? They got you kicked out by your friends. People don't know that, a lot of people don't know that Chuck D and Professor Griff, these were community activists. They weren't rappers. These were people that worked with children and was trying those same concepts that you speak of in the 80s and the 90s were trying to build their community, empower their community. And if whether it's rhetoric, whether it's hate speech that's perceived, they hear that there's a supreme power over them that's keeping them in these low disenfranchised states. So I must speak my truth to that power in order for me to build up. And you brought up some great things. There would be no word ghetto. We we know the word ghetto because that is a Jewish word. So 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 we know uh, and you know about disenfranchisement but from that same time as the the originators of the ghetto we also have to understand for us when we hear things like redlining and things like that when it comes to capitalism these are things where it's like oh i'm never going to be able to get out of the position that i am so then all i can do is speak the truth that i know the books that i've read is that i got to speak my truth to power and even as a person who has individually succeeded w with capitalism None of us is great as all of us. I'm not successful until we all are successful. So everything that I know, everything I learned, the purpose of this form is to spread to my people. Now, if I'm spreading hate, let's get that out of here because that's a distraction. I don't want to hate anyone, but I want to uplift, build, and say, I read this, and that's how I did I learned from Rabbi Cooper that if I do this, this, and this in my community, I can enrich my community. So therefore, we're going to pass that on. This will be around forever. So now I'm feeding my people and I'm feeding my people love not hate so let let me uh, make a couple of other points about victimization I think that's the other lesson that I learned from a man like Simon Wiesenthal because it would have been so easy for him he was a victim in a sense an ultimate victim Indeed. he never defaulted to that position that took an amazing amount of humanity say it. that that's uh, also when you read the literature um, uh, about um, you know, newly freed slaves or the, the effort to, in the 20th century, including right in, in, in our hometown of, uh, of New York, you know, the efforts to raise yourself up without uh, allowing the negative to envelop you completely. That's not so simple. Right. Uh, and what you have, 
but I don't know how many times I've, I'm interviewed by the media. So tell us about the statistics of hate crimes. We don't crimes. like the media either. You know, the state, <laughs> tell us about the statistics on hate crimes. Right. I said, well, it's really very easy. Ever since 1991 or 92, when the FBI has been keeping official statistics, ex with the exception of the three months after 9-11, mm -hmm. the number one target of race-based hate crimes in America, African Americans. What to say? <laughs> and the number one target of religion-based hate crimes in America are the Jews. Absolutely. Now, if you would ask me, is that a one-two position that we want to maintain? We're very happy to offload that <laughs> yeah, to, nah, that we, to we someone that else. To but else. the <laughs> fact that it's still there, and the fact when you see it transmuted onto social media, you see the things in the real life, and then feeding, you know, back and forth. The, I learned from someone like Simon Wiesenthal and all the other survivors that I've had the honor of meeting and interacting with is that if you can uh, avoid the victimization route, mm -hmm. your chances of success in the real world are really enhanced. Uh, if you default to the victimization, uh, chances are you're not going to be able uh, to crawl out of that hole. Not that it was a fair place to start from, from the, the beginning. From the beginning, but when I you know think back of, uh, of Mr. Wiesenthal, and of course he never left the Holocaust. Man, think about it. He the guy was Vienna an arch. He's an in. architect. Yeah. <laughs> do do the math. He's an architect. He's in a in a DP di displaced persons camp. Right. A few months after the war, with his friends, uh, on uh, on a Friday night, and uh, with the Shabbat candles. And they're all talking and saying, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a jeweler in Antwerp. And right. I'm going to go into, well, if I can, I have a cousin in Chicago, maybe I can get into real estate. And then people turn around and they say, Wiesenthal, you're an architect. Did you notice that the entire continent of Europe is destroyed? Right. You could become a very rich man. He built a couple of buildings before the war. And, and he said, you know, everybody around here is a believer. So I know for sure you'll be a jeweler, you'll be the, you're all going to be successful, but there'll become a time, as we say, after 120 years, because Moses lived to be 120. So you always say to somebody, after 120 years, which means when you die, <laughs> oh, right. when we all die and go up to, to the heavenly court, I'll be the rich man and you'll be the poor ones. Because he said, I'm the only one who didn't forget them. So mm -hmm. he found purpose in his life by staying true and being a kind of unofficial ambassador for victims. That's a tremendous See, and you're speaking thing of, that he took. Of, of course, you're speaking of, of concepts and ideologies that is innate in your lineage and in, in the things that you pass on from one child to another. And that's been robbed from us. That's we we're told that we're less than from day one. So I don't have a, oh you know you'll be a jeweler you'll be this. It's told to me there's a school to prison pipeline. It's told to me by based off the test scores that I get in the third grade uh, how long I'm gonna spend in prison. Like so I don't have those amazing stories like you have uh, to necessarily just pass around. I, I'm gonna change. Uh, in fact, I'll leave names out. But I'm gonna tell you a story that happened to me. That, sh that brought home your point to, and, and sort of refocused a little bit how I viewed my, my job and my life. So we have a traveling exhibition on the Holocaust called Courage to Remember. It's been in many languages, been 30 years, we've put it on the road all over the world, every continent. A few years ago, we had the honor of bringing the exhibition right next to the tomb of Martin Luther King Jr. in Atlanta. Wow. It was for me, just there were no words. So when I came there, there was um, a very dapper, you know, the Atlanta folks are. They, they, they can dress. Oh, man. They get it going. <laughs> I, mean, it was, I mean, this guy it was, it was quite amazing. Full of swag. And he said, you know, Rabbi Cooper, you know, I'm, I'm state senator so and so. And I said, well, you know, great to meet you. Thanks for coming. But you know, about like 30 minutes early. <laughs> All right. He said, no, I came early because I wanted to share something with you. I've been thinking on this a long, long time, and I wanted to share it with the appropriate person. 
He said, I was born in Harlem, probably around the same time as you. We were born in Brooklyn, you said. Right, right. So there were seven kids in the family. I was the middle child. And I think there were six separate fathers. My mom was a single mom. And she must have been one heck of a mom because... Had to be. Shouts out to the he, black queen. She, she la- she, <laughs> he landed up in Columbia. He went Amazing. to law school. Against all odds, big success. Came down to Georgia. Got into politics. Dressed to the nines. Yeah, successful. And he said, but I want to tell you something. A couple of years ago, I started doing research about my lineage because it was about where did I come from? And he said, and I have, as you can imagine, I've got plenty of good contacts. And after exhaustive research, I was able to trace myself back to a plantation in Virginia in 1851. Mm -hmm. Before that, I have no idea. Nothing. And when he took, and we're standing next to the tomb, next to the story of the Holocaust, You don't have to get into a bidding war about who suffered more. The thing that Wiesenthal's generation, the survivors did, primarily for the Jews but not only, is we were lucky that some survived because they were the bridge to our past. Right. Without that, we'd be looking down the same black hole. Indeed. And and, and that, that vortex. So let's just say I'm much more attuned and sensitive to that fact yeah and that, and and that's an open wound i get it as yeah. someone who's got and pretty strong jewish dna yeah. i get it i get it and they keep telling us that you know get over it or you know uh, you don't have to, why are you guys always bringing up slavery and it and in these conversations these strong conversations uh, amongst the diaspora that and and, and you know whether it's myself and Griff. We speak in a way because we know that even during those times, as far as we can take it back, white supremacy has built themselves up on our backs. So at this time, as we were gaining knowledge of self, as we are understanding these great principles that you're speaking of that you have a connection to, that's where like, oh, okay, now we're finding the gold. Now we're reading the Torah. Now we, and in that sense, and that's when we had that conversation about anti-Semitism, which was a, a title, which I, Griff said this in the interview, like, they threw it on us to divide us. And I was like, he's 100% right. And that's what's happening right now. They're trying to divide us with this term. And then so therefore, in a very charismatic and maybe we could have did it, you know, like we, we did it in a very pastoral way where it was like anti-Semi, you break down Semitism, which is Sem means Shem, and right. Shem and Ham were Noah's lineage. Like we, we know these things when I've, I've studied these things. So all to say, there's a commonality. I am, I, I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, and that's what I want to tap into because I felt like so many people got hurt when I say that, you know, the, the true Hebrews, and, and it wasn't, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have used the true, and then like, just like, if, if there's Hebrew blood that I believe is flowing through my body and Hebrew blood that's flowing through your body, that doesn't separate us, that doesn't cancel you out, that makes us brothers. That's why I sit here and say my brother or my sister, because I'm finding commonality, right. not I, get I'm, out of here, you guys aren't. I'm with you, except this. for this one thing we have to confront that we Please. have to state, and Please. that is the following. Unless Louis Farrakhan is an agent of white supremacy, he's made a choice for reasons I never understood. I definitely don't believe that. Okay, he's, I don't believe that either. So it means that he's made the choice to set up a, uh, a statements that are designed to divide us, that are designed to keep us apart. You can't call, look, you can say maybe Hebrew, okay, when you say Judaism is a gutter religion, when you say the, when you say Hitler was a great man. We all know the power of words, we do, and right. that's why we're sitting there And, and he's day. a much more powerful communicator than the two of us put together. That's the truth. He's, he's an amazing orator, like right. you said. But in, in, this, in that sense to where, and if it, again, hateful rhetoric, propaganda, whether we're talking about Zionism or banking or anything, we even us, we've sat here, even in this time we sat here and made reference to stereotypes 
And we've laughed about it. We joked about it. But you know why? Because there's a commonality. There's no malice. There's no hate. Right. We can say, oh, you know, you Jewish people can do this. Oh, you know, you black people know how to dress or whatever. And it's, it's love. It's, there's, there's nothing, there's no hate there. So, and again, maybe it's about representation. Maybe when I'm talking to Professor Griff, you know, Rabbi Cooper should be on the other side of the table because, and well, I'm glad I get to bring this up in this moment, because that conversation between Pro- Professor Griff and, and I probably would have never happened if it wasn't for you. And I say that because if we go all the way I, back to 1989, I, I spend most of my life, uh, you know, taking uh, taking the heat. So. You are the rabbi that caused Public Enemy to break up. Right. And as I mentioned to you, I actually never heard of Professor Griff because he wasn't listed as uh, uh, talent. Uh, yeah, but you can also argue that I'm the person who, who broke put the, up Public Enemy. No, who put Public Enemy uh, on the front page of the papers and on the Today Show and all the rest. Shouts out to Chuck thing. D. Flavor, flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever met anyone from Public Enemy? Uh, well, let's. See. Well, you did. You got a chance to meet Chuck D. Because of you took him to the, the Museum of Time. Chuck D. Uh, we were also on the Today Show together. Many, many, many. When's many. the last time you spoke to Chuck? Probably 25 years ago. Wow. We gotta get y'all reunited. What's he doing these days? Speaking, leading, teaching. You know, he's 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 a he's a, a rabbi to the hip hop community. Everybody knows rabbi means you so, know teacher, a teacher. Leader. It's a lot of work. Yeah, he, and of, he has taught me. You know, I've sat on panels with him. I I study his music, and he you know he just performed at the BET Awards. Uh, I'll send you the tape. But the <laughs> but in that sense, I, we we joke and we joke, but you. At the time, and, and if you could just, you know, let's unpack it a little bit. Tell me, when you first heard of Public Enemy, what was it that said, I believe this rap group of young black men are anti-Semitic? It was the lyrics. I mean, I'm not a music critic. Yeah, and that's, I, to me, and that's what, I still don't know what they, what they said. And even in that conversation with group, because, again, I was a kid. I grew up as, but I didn't know. And, again, we don't want to perpetuate what they said. But you felt right. whatever they said was hateful to your community. So here, here's the, the point that I tried to make back, back then in the earliest days of rap in which my Jewish friend said, What's rap? <laughs> and we played the song three times. What are you talking about? What did he say? What did he say? <laughs> <Huh>? Okay. <Yeah. laughs> right? <laughs> and that was before, you know, rap changed the world. Now it's right. a universal language. Right. I travel the world. You get off the plane in, in, in Tokyo, in, in Jerusalem, everywhere. Hip hop has taken over the world. Hip hop has changed the world. It, it has. It has. But back in its birthing process. Right. Um, again, for the same reason, when I'm, our job is to look uh, at what's going on, what the trends are, who's saying what. Uh, when that came out, uh, at, and if I was smart enough, I would have invested maybe in Sony Music, although I want you to know, Sony Music in the United States only had to deal with me once. Uh. In Japan, we took down Sony Music twice wow. on stuff that they were doing. You there, came back. Then you came back. Did you come back? Guns and Roses, too, or something? Well, Guns and Roses. It was just, doing some. You was knocking uh, everybody down. Ed, ed, edgy, <laughs> edgy stuff. But that's my point. Right. In other words, for me, it wasn't about that. You know, what zip code or what color skin a person. If you from. Heard, if you heard hate, you wanted to right. And especially bring it to a since piece. I do, you know, I was in only, your opinion. I yeah. was an alto when I was growing up oh, in the choir sorry. that I was in. <laughs> and I never graduated from there. But I know Rabbi something got about talent. That's my the, new show. Mm. <laughs> I got, I got, a, um, I have a love of music, yes. and I know that music is the most powerful force on this planet. Right. So it's real simple. You do the math. You have the most powerful force. Yeah. And then you have, uh, you know, cultural stuff that's doing, and then you have the the music scene in the United States, which I'm sure you'll do twenty different shows are. Yeah. Um, but back then it was quite dynamic, and when it crossed the line in terms of lyrics the message was that sorry that doesn't compute it's also a signal to the companies not just the talent that you know you shouldn't be marketing stuff that includes a message of hate right and if it isn't hate you better do a better job of of explaining it now okay to your point even if it's something hateful i agree with you a hundred percent if there's content that is hateful purposefully hateful we should do away with that but then you get into and, and I this is what I believe. You can you have the right 
to say whatever you that want. That is correct. But you also have to deal with the consequences of what you say. And that's why I'm a, so outspoken because I would deal, I would stand and fall on my sword. If it came out of my mouth, I'm responsible for it. But in saying all of that, and this is why I ask your help, Rabbi, because I feel like I'm currently in a position right now sitting here across from me as we speak. And a lot of it is because I'm sitting with you. Everybody is throwing hate at me right now. I made a lot of people mad. I made um, your community mad. I made my community mad I, by apologizing. I told you what was going to happen. <laughs> you did. I'm not smarter than you. I'm just <laughs> older. You, like, I no, said, you know they ain't going to be rocking with you, right? <laughs> and you're right because, and, and I'm trying to have a bigger thinking. You said, if you sit down with me, well, first you said, I have to apologize. I have no problem apologizing to anybody. I'm man enough. I, if I hurt you, I'm sorry. I'll say that to anyone I hurt. Whether it's a, if I'm driving in my car and I'm not paying attention to something and I, I, I hit someone with my car, I'm not going to jump. I'm like, that wasn't my intentions to run your ass over. <laughs> I first have to say, I'm sorry. And then I have to correct the situation. So if I hit you with my car, I'm sorry. And, but now I'm in a position where like, God, cancel me, I don't care. I've, I've left NBC, I've left several companies. I don't need their money, I don't care about that. But now I'm in a position where I have some great partners and some great friends, uh, colleagues, who stood beside me and said, Nick, we gotta change some things. You gotta say this differently. We gotta, can never talk about, the, don't say this. This is offensive to the, just like the N word is offensive to you guys. When we hear this, it's the same. Had some great conversations. But then I've had some conversations where higher ups have told me that I was gonna be made an example of. And it wasn't even about me and someone that said something about another community. We have to make an example out of him because it, we, this has to stop. And I'm like, okay, I'll make an example out of me. Let's make a good example out of me. Don't perpetuate these stereotypical ideas that Jewish people run everything or Jewish people have the power to cancel you. And then if you say you don't want stereotypes, but then you cancel me? I don't really know where to begin if we're really trying to get reconciliation. And I've, ca I've called people. I will talk to I'll tell you I'm sorry. I'll tell you I'm sorry in front of you, in the camera, whatever you want. Because I know there's no malice or hate in my heart. And I believe there's no malice and hate in your heart. And, and we, we're successful living, breathing people in one of the toughest years we've ever experienced. Let's show unity to where I can say sorry to you to your face. And I'm, I'm met with silence. Or I'm met with aggression. No, we don't accept your apology. That's not sorry enough. <laughs> That's a non-apology. I'm like, I'm asking to be corrected from your community. Give me books. Teach me. <laughs> I am an empty vessel, an empty broken vessel. Teach me, fix me, lead me. As and and that's why I, I can say I love you for this opportunity because I know you catching it uh, as well. But to have this conversation, uh in a non-judgmental form, in a non-judgmental way. And even though you did say, if someone wants a PhD in <laughs> Jewish hatred, they kick all this off, <laughs> then... Uh, well, you are a very I, effective communicator. Yes, and thank you. And I believe I'll be that sacrifice. I have no problem being that sacrifice. If this, if this whole ordeal brings people closer together like you, are, you and I are now and can talk about any subject matter and get clarity, a uh, job well done. You talk about a purpose life. You talk about the great uh, Mr. Wiesenthal. Um, I admire him. I admire someone who can go straight into the trenches, build his office in Vienna, Nazi central, white supremacy central. Yes. And say I'm at y'all. That's how we would say I'm getting at you. We we here. I pull. I pulled up. What's happening? Like that's that's how I view that. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he did. You know, that, that's, uh, that's a the, real rider right there. The first time I visited Mr. Wiesenthal in Vienna, back in 1978, okay? First time I was in that country. Right. 
And they weren't so used to seeing some younger guys walking around, you know, with their, they, they knew what it was. They, <laughs> they, they didn't like it. Was. <laughs> so he said, be in the lobby of the Intercontinental at 10 a.m. I'll pick you up and drive you. Of course, I didn't know what kind of driver he was before. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. That's another story. It's a whole other story. So I'm, and, and it's a Wasn't big, the best driver, ladies it, it, it's the it, It's the classic European kind of hotel. It's a massive right. kind of uh, uh, hall. And I'm waiting there, and about three minutes after 10, I see this hulking guy comes. I see he's coming in from the opposite door. It's about a half a block away, maybe less. And he's walking, and then he sees me, and he starts yelling, Ab, Ab, <laughs> Abe, <Hey>. Ab. <laughs> yeah. So I ran over to him. I said, Simon, are you okay? Is everything all right? I said, yeah, of course. What's the what's what's the problem? I said, Well, you were screaming at the top of your lungs in my name. So said, no, no, you don't understand. I want he should see I came in, <laughs> and he points to about five people on the staff right. who were over sixty. Mm. I want he should know I'm here. I want he should know I'm here. Right. So, and yet he was uh, really, in a sense, the ultimate humanitarian groups. The Tutsi Indians from the Americas came to see him. Uh, right. uh, the the gypsies, uh, unbelievable victims of the Nazis, including oh, forgotten. Yes. He yeah. wouldn't forget them. Right. So he stood up. He he became in his lifetime, you know, uh, a real symbol. And it it was hard enough trying to live up to a living legend. <laughs> and and you know, in a way, it really in, informs us going beyond. Well, you're carrying think, on his legacy in a, in a right. wonderful way. And, and the bottom line is when. You haven't been yet, but you you will soon. When you come to Museum of Tolerance, we next week we we don't try to be too judgmental because right. I think maybe rabbis after they graduate from being like pulpit rabbis or pastors, yeah. you get to, you don't want to lecture people at all. You don't. You right. want them to come to un, and understand feel comfortable. It. But we have one spot in the museum which is an absolute. Uh, I would say, if you want to know what we really believe in. So when you come in, you're introduced to by this guy uh, coming out on the screen, and uh, and in the end he says, "Okay, now choose which door you want to enter the museum." Mm. One door, I know where you going. the gr green door is without prejudice, and the red door is with prejudice. Right. And I remember that when the advance team from the Dalai Lama came to the museum. Yeah. Oh, they were really, one guy was like really bent out of shape. Why? Because if you pull the green door, it's locked. <laughs> and the sign comes up and says, think, now use the other door. Right. So life is all about, don't deny that right. yeah, we it all have prejudices. Exist. We all have prejudices. I always given. say that. That's a given. The question is how are you going to handle it? Now, we all with, pre, we've, a lot of people have prejudged, then that's what's brought us here to this So table. with the Dalai Lama's guy, I finally said to him, look, what are you worried about? If he really is a god, the door's going to open. <laughs> right. And you know, when the Dalai Lama, who's one of the greatest people I ever met, came, he w made a beeline for the red door. Right. Mm. He just knew. He, he, he's, I've seen this trick before. No, no, <laughs> no. It's who, who he was. He, he, he's honest. People who get it, you know, get it. We're not out to create But that's the thing. Everybody's saints. Per pretending that they're perfect. And that's why I come from a place, I know I'm flawed. I know I can say things that may be looked at as like, yo, Nick Wilding for that. But I'm, I embrace who I am and try to live my truth. So I, and in that sense of everything that was, that you saw in our, my conversation with Grizz and that was all the things, and like I said, there's, you can go to the internet, you're going to hear some poems from me, some songs, some all type of things where he was like, ooh, that's a little harsh, but I have accepted that you know, I prejudge. Yes, like that. Prejudice means to prejudge, and I pre I prejudge every situation before I step into it. But I don't prejudge anything with hate because I don't feel like there's an ounce of hate in my heart. So, but I'm not afraid to talk about anything. I'm not afraid to. to I want to talk about centralized banking and and the Federal Reserve and and I want then Jekyll Island. I want to talk about banking too because <laughs> I'd like to get a piece of the action. <laughs> if we own all the but banks, what happened? Yeah, like, why you didn't get your share? <laughs> But no, and again, because when I speak of those things, and that's what to me got mixed up in that, and even when the the savagery and lesson, I was speaking from books that I've I've read and know 
about white supremacy. I wasn't speaking at one point. I I was not speaking. Now I hate I hate white supremacy. And I will say this: you don't have to be white to practice the energy of white supremacy. There's black people who practice white supremacy who are who are religiously living that to this day. So even in that sense of because what I learned from from in the recent times, even when I said this is a statement, I definitely would take back. I said I can't be anti-Semitic because I'm from the Semitic people. I was 100% wrong by saying that. One of the reasons, because whether you believe my DNA and whether we can go ancestry.com or wherever we go and see who, if I do have, you know, Hebrew blood flowing through my body, just because I'm a Hebrew doesn't mean I can't perpetuate hate of propaganda. Course. Because yeah. I know black people who are definitely black who project hate towards the black community. So in saying that, I would love to retract that statement, but the only thing in which I was saying, it was I was trying to say, how can you be ostracized uh, from something that is your own? And that, and, and it, I, it clearly got lost in translation. But I say all of that to say, if our goals are the same goals, why aren't we allies? I, I've sat here and I've watched you, every time we get into these conversations in, in, you, you bring up the, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan as if, like, that's where the hate began and that's where it all goes back to. And that's one individual, powerful individual, great order, all of those things. But you and I are not him. Correct. Um, and I don't want to reference him in speaking. Now, you'll be, I, I would love to see you two sit down. That would be amazing. I'll give my popcorn. Well, uh, and and I and that's one of the questions of like why hasn't that happened? I know there's been invitations, but that's that's beyond me because that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to discuss. And even the question I asked is like in the current position that I'm in, where everybody mad at Nick. How do we get past it? How do we fix it? I've said I'm sorry. I know the Hebrew law. I know you. I've, I've, is, is it how many more times do I have to ask for forgiveness before people say, oh, he's disingenuine or or oh we you know oh he he apologized to the jews but he didn't apologize to the whites i don't see it's i hate the only thing i hate is white supremacy and i will never apologize for that yeah. and if i if, if because oh uh, because last time i checked white people are more like a uh, i have a joke in one of my stand-up he's like, like an eggshell alabaster we should start we should start describing people like they describe paint at home depot <laughs> <laughs> maybe if we because in, i'm the color of my skin is not black the color of your skin is not white but the idea of white supremacy, I said it's, a, it's an acronym, when having inheritance to everything, <laughs> like when you believe you own everything, I have a problem with that. When, and, and you've told the world that you reign over others, I have the biggest issue with that. And I will hate that until the day I die. And I will die for that because that's how much I love my people and I love my community and I love you. I don't think... Everything that I I know it pains me like and I know we probably gonna hug and shed tears and I'm gonna tell you all the things I understand when when I go to the museum of tolerance because I've seen the movies I've read the books this current book made me emotional to know that there's so much hate for a community but you know where that you know what that common hate for the black community comes from and the Jewish community comes from white supremacy the idea of eugenics that was placed on us and still placed on us today in America and that Hitler adopted that's correct from came from America from America and to which caused the Holocaust is white supremacy and now being used by the Communist Party in China so to, against Muslims that's hate that's evil that's what you and I hate so how can I get our community how can I stop the hate coming towards me, and let's let's project it, and direct it in the right. right direction, and get over this. Right. So I think you and I are not interested in an apology tour at all. Okay, uh, you're too good looking, and I'm too old. All right. so let's get to the core of the things that I did wrong, and and the things that hurt people. The clarity on it. Let's learn. Let's learn right now the things that are offensive to you and what we have to do away with. And I would love to start with specifically um, the, because I feel like there's, it was probably three things. And, uh, and, 
in specifically in this tape that kind of set it all off and then we can talk bigger picture of how to mend these relationships because again we we are one in the same and i feel like there's an energy that doesn't want us to operate together because they would know if we did then so many other things and so many other beautiful revelations would be revealed um but I think one of the first ones, and whether it's fact or fiction or why it's perpetuated, but probably one of the more, most hurtful things that I, I've heard uh, come from people was even the conversation of the Rothschilds um, is looked at as hateful rhetoric. And, and, and the only from what I thought it would be was like, oh, because that's the idea that Jewish people run the world. Uh, and there's this secret society, there's Illuminati, and, and again, I have definitely been the conspiracy theorist. I mean, I've, I, I got into it, and I said, I get it from my dad, because, you know, all of these books have some type of theory that there's this secret society that runs this entire world, this one world government, new world order, and it's all driven by capitalism and money. And whether you believe it to be true or you don't believe it to be true, a lot of times the Jewish community gets the rap for being the the creators and, and the organizers of this right. secret society. So uh, there's a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Mm-hmm. Is this a book I should read? Uh, well, we actually put out a book that debunks it chapter okay, so by I chapter. Read that one. So maybe okay. it, no, I don't. Give me. I want the we'll, book that we'll debunks it. We'll give you the book, it. but that book <laughs> includes everything in the original book. Okay, so and, I want the debunking. Of right. It. So, but the protocols, the elders, it's a really powerful idea. You just described it. Right. That in a really complicated world, the reason why things happen is that there are a couple of people who sort of control everything. This book was written at the behest of the Russian Tsar in the late 1800s. Mm. Okay? He didn't particularly like Jews. Right. They suffered. Maybe I'm an American because... My grandparents on both sides, we got to get out of here. There's no hope. We'll never have any rights. Right. Then, uh, you know, they eventually he was killed. And, yeah, the Russian, the Soviet Revolution, and we're, we're still dealing with the ramifications of that. But he put together this, uh, he had his agents write a book that cast the Jews this way, that they were this small group of people wow. were the root of all evil. Now, to give you an idea so of So it's not the, the Jewish people, it's the Russians. <laughs> no, the power, the power of the idea. So how the world works. Right. When the Russian Revolution came in 1917, the white Russians right. Right, <laughs> fled eventually from the red, the communist Russians. Right, right. They brought with them to places like Hong Kong, mm-hmm. Tokyo, and other places around the world, they came as refugees, but some of them were very well healed. They brought the book with them. Mm. So that book got translated All into Japanese world. and right. Chinese. It just I know a little bit about Asia to give you a real quick thing. In China, they said they read this book and said, Oh, really? The Jews control the banks, they control the media? When can we have lunch with them? When can we pencil it in? <laughs> these are guys we want to... <laughs> we need to get to know these now, guys. The Japanese, their reaction was fear. All right. So I'll give you... A, this is actually something that I experienced. So this is already in the 21st century. One right. of the major publishing companies of Japan. But is, where does... Because even that feels like a generalization. Or is oh, no, just, no. It's very specific. The Jews, they have the elders. It's a structured thing. And they start all the wars. They make all the money. They start COVID nineteen, and they're going to make the vaccine to make all the money. It's the Are same you thing conspiracy over theories and over, over again. again. But here, here, here's what happened. In, when I finished the presentation to uh, this company in Japan with their top leadership there, uh, since I'm from Brooklyn, at the end of the presentation, right? What do you say? Does anybody have any questions? Right. Now, I've been told, I've been to Japan 40 times. Right. When you're in Japan, never ask at the <laughs> end or any questions because it's group thinking. And, of course, I'm from Brooklyn, so I always ask. They never have a question. Right. This time, the number one dude in the room gets up, executive vice president, and said, yes, rabbi, we have a question. 
thank you for explaining to us that Jews don't go to synagogue on your Sabbath, and this is a quote, in order to plot the economic downfall of Japan. Wow. And then he went on, in two minutes he summarized my whole hour lecture. I said, well, that's terrific. Uh, <laughs> you, you really summarize things well, but what's your question? And the, his question is relevant to where we're going in this conversation. What do Jews do in synagogue? Meaning, there's a trap that we shouldn't be getting into, which is, you don't beat your wife, I'm not an anti-Semite, I don't hate blacks, except these are the things we don't, we're not, we're this, we're that, etc. I apologize, and didn't realize, etc. you know, insensitive. His question changed my job. It suddenly dawned on me, you know, if you're lucky enough to go all over the world, you have access to people from other cultures. And there may be some hate, but more than anything else, it's curiosity. They want to understand what are your values. And that's basically with people of goodwill. This is what I've learned from my life experience. Cultures are different. People are different. Religions are different. But everywhere you go, you can find people of uh, good people have a spirit who want to work together with others. They're less concerned about the differences. They want to find ways to work together and make it a better world. That's what I learned. And that's you why know, we're here. When I go to Japan and people, and they, some of them say, oh no, <laughs> this guy's back again. Yeah, right. Like, didn't he die yet? <laughs> you know? Oh, he keeps the Sabbath? Could he keep it two days? So, <laughs> so the, point, the point being is, look, uh, I can't look inside your soul. Right, and 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 it's not my job to do that. Right, um, I think you've taken certain steps. You can ascribe those steps to pressure from the outside, from right. the upper echelon, whatever, or you can say it's purposeful. This is a person who is uh, all about learning. It's kind of learning in a glass booth in front of the whole world in right. real time. <laughs> I don't know if that's the smartest thing in the world to do, but that's. <laughs> but I'm that's, still. I'm gonna read. If but, somebody give me something, but, I'm gonna read but it. But that's that's his mo. Maybe I shouldn't reinterpret everything that I read. No, I think <laughs> that's part. You know, knowledge knowledge is uh, is power, but also, you know, figuring out what's you know what's real, and and what's uh, you know out there to try to leverage you in a certain direction. And even more than because this is a thing too, because everybody's like, oh, you shouldn't apologize if, if that's your truth or that's the truth, but. I should apologize anytime I hurt someone. But if we're speaking about things that are facts, that whether it's the truth and like I think you said you said this, uh, I mean it's a it's a quote. Uh or I'll start with that. A lie don't care <laughs> who tells it, you know. And you when we said when I said that, you said the same thing is like a, a lie can run around the world before the truth has the opportunity to put on his tennis shoes. So if there's something that is not true, let's throw that away, or if are not associated with it. Like we, there's so many stereotypes about black people, that even the same thing of black people are violent and they like to, you know, they and they're, they're the ones or, black on black crime. These or, are all false or, narratives. Or Jews can't dunk. Yeah. Well, well, go to the Israeli basketball league. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah. I know, I know yeah. one. His name is Amari Stoudemire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he'd be dunking the hell out the ball. <laughs> right. And he's now, you know, he's a precious symbol to both our people. Yes, I love. That's my brother. But what's really important about him is, that's not why he's doing it. He's following his he's path sincere. in life. It's his path. Yeah. And that's the that's a power. That's yeah. an empowerment. Yeah. So, you know, I I can't. Uh, at the end of the day, you talk about sincerity, you talk about uh, motivation. Uh, there is a situation out there right now, I can point to ESPN, I can point to the NFL, and, and I do. I'm not shy about these guys. Right. Uh, and, and because at the end of the day, I think what we all would like to get to what's called the level playing field. Indeed. And right now, we're not anywhere near close to it. Right. And... Um, you know, we shouldn't squander the opportunity of what's going on now in America right. by having the folks and groups and organizations making uh, wrong decisions. So let me give you an example. Okay. If, uh, I was listening. This, if I was listening. sitting across right now from, uh, uh, what's his name, the guy who heads up the NBA. Uh, 
You're talking about, oh, the the, the, the current commissioner, yeah. Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A, fri- a, f- so a friend yeah. of mine. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's what I was Adam suggest. Silver. Adam, yeah. Adam Silver. Yeah, yeah. I've met him before. Yeah. Right. We, shared, we, we shared a plane to the All-Star game a few times. Okay. My, my, so, my man. So, so my here, juice, here's the point. Here, here's what I would suggest. <laughs> What's the teaching take? What's the takeaway from everything that's going on right now, and how do you put that to work on the court, mm. the NBA? Right. Okay? So if you're asking me, I have a very very simple idea. Every month, and you can start with African Americans, but eventually maybe it'll be something more permanent. Right. Every month, you take the image of another American hero. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, whatever, you know, there's no shortage. At and, all. you know, let's say you come up with uh, 20 of those names. Right. Every single basketball court, the hardwood, mm. has that image for one month or whatever it is. That's, through, a, that's a great and, idea. Which is so that every single kid coming in to the arena, right, who's be with a parent or an older brother and say, Who's that? Right. The whole trick, the whole idea, and you know it about, you know, the path to faith and knowledge is knowing to ask a question. Right. So what you do is you put those images on the hardwood floor near the side part where the three-point line is. Right. Okay? You do that. Curiosity. Start with the African Americans. You can then take... Great names in medicine, Latino, whatever. You, the NBA is not too shabby when it comes to marketing. Right. But that's the path. That's the direction they be, should, should be taking it. What if they if these guys are all going to start going into the political domain? Right. So I'm not worried about their bottom line. They are ATM machines. Right. But I am worried about a squandered opportunity. You have kids. They're all playing ball, whether it's football, peewee ball, or it's or it's basketball, and you have that hierarchy when you get to the top. Yeah, there's great power there. Right. So use it the right way in Indeed. order to introduce so the you're real heroes. You utilize sports, entertainment, media to to instead of any type of propaganda that's all already out there, use positive images to to do away with it. Because to your point, in the situation I'm current currently in. I believe the media has sensationalized so much to and to to further the divide. And I always right. say the media is manipulated entertainment designed to influence all or to influence America. Uh, and it's really, especially now, everyone's sitting at home. We're quarantined. We're scared. We're upset. And then when you see there's a reason to do something, to argue, to tweet. to So we're in this moment where people are paying attention, but now we're allowing negativity to be perpetuated opposed to conversations it's, and things like that. It's this. like a tsunami. We saw it in the last few hours before I came over here. I checked yeah. with Michelle Alkin, our director of communications. She said we're, we, there's huge attacks on us. On I said, you surprised? She yeah. said, no, it's coming. They big from, mad is what he's saying. They big yeah, mad at us. They're big mad. That's okay. <laughs> we, we have a big boy pants are. We, can, yeah, we exactly. can deal with it. We can handle it. But a lot of that is the noise. The core question for everybody in our community is, um, I'm sure they'll be polite when they ask it. Some of them won't. Right. Is he sincere? Is this real? Do you Do feel whatever. I'm sincere? At this point, yes. Thank you, because I, tr- I truly really, am sincere. I, you know what I wrote? I sent to... Uh, the so gentleman on the phone when you were on the, the phone with him? The big phone. You know what I wrote? <laughs> I sent him four words. Right. He's a serious person. Uh, and, and I don't expect that to be proven overnight. Right. This is a long game. It is. This is something. This is we're we going to build. We're going to grow. This is, we sat down today, but we're going to continue to sit down. And me and you, we're going we gonna to be boys. So, you, you know, I think at the end of the day, all of us have to be – uh, of course, concerned about how, you know, uh, you're you're in the public eye in a big way. You're a creative uh, person. You like it. You're good at it. Thank you. You want to get better at it. I need to make you more of a fan, though. Uh, okay, maybe someday. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, get you on the mass singer. At the end of the you day, you said you're alto, right? We get you on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as long as we're talking about, I wasn't going to say anything, but. So, you know, for me, because I grew up, th- I 
born in 50, right? Right, so right. So you're talking about the OJs. Okay. The oh, come on. Now you're talking that talk. That's a, okay. OJ's my favorite group. You understand that the Jewish kids growing up in the New York, Washington corridor, Baltimore and stuff, my roommate was from Baltimore. He introduced, I'm talking about my Jewish roommate, right, my right. religious Jewish roommate. Right. He introduced me. To Motown, and that was it. Wow, you, you know, it's Hasidic in. masters, yeah, and Motown. And <laughs> even now, you know, I uh, I usually uh, study Talmud with my actually my son-in-law by uh, Zoom. Okay, at, right. at about I finish about twelve thirty in the morning. Right, and sometimes you know I'll go to the playlist, throw some Motown on, and I'll put on you know OJ on, Stairway uh, to Heaven or something. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Or, you know, Papa was a Rolling Stone. If you have a, a month, if you have a month to to wait till the song finishes, <laughs> right? Is it, right. The first verse don't start till like three so, minutes in, <laughs> right? Right. So the music music is universal, but that, in a sense, coming full circle, that's the point. In other words, I looking back now historically, people who didn't start out as musicians or a group. They were activists in their community, and suddenly this thing sprouted forward. That might, ex you know, explain it. But now we're in the 21st century, right? And uh, you know, hopefully, we all grow up a little bit. I know we get older. I don't know if we grow up, right? And the bottom line is that if uh, what I'm hearing is an interest and a commitment to want to do things together to move forward for the betterment of people, indeed, that'll be the proof of the pudding, right? So that's what, like, how? Don't well, I don't need to go back and parse? Yeah, no, what I was, was wrong. No, we bad that. I'm saying that. we definitely understand that. So my question is, what are the next steps? How do we do that? Because that's a great thing to say. We got. I mean, I'm tired of saying we got to grow closer together. Right. I'm so, tired. I'm I'm tired of that. I'm saying, what so are the gonna, next steps? The next step is we're going to sit down together on Monday. Okay. And we're going to talk about the next step yeah and we already know i am going to israel and that's a that's a that I, I said that you know in one of my many statements but <laughs> uh, would you but, take would you take your dad on that trip i would you should absolutely and if you do i'll come along so i can protect you <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're gonna have some interesting conversations no, but <laughs> I, I th has he been to israel yet no he hasn't well i mean I, when i tell you that's a lifelong I, dream a, of our family leaving christian yeah Come on. Come on. I, I, my, I have eight grandchildren in Jerusalem. Wow. And I have two daughters, son-in-law. And um, I have to tell you one thing about Jerusalem. There's something about the light there. You can't capture it even on an uh, iPhone 11. I've heard about this. Okay? And I believe that there's a piece of the light of Jerusalem that's unique to each person. But you got to show up to claim it. Wow. Well, I'm on my way. Okay. That is so, definitely... Uh, uh, a great place to probably end this session. And uh, I, I, uh, I, I look forward to that. It's a it process. Is. It is. It's not going to happen overnight. And I, I, and I didn't, let's be clear too, I didn't do this to, to in a sense of, oh, let's show the world that we can work together. I did this from a place of sincerity, of true understanding, in the same way that I sit down with anyone in that chair or any other chair when we have this. This is an academic forum. And whatever the text is, whatever I'm told to read, and you know, even me still studying the Torah daily, and and, and the the process is, I want to learn, I want to grow, and and I have that curiosity of mankind. And when I look to elders like yourself with, with great reverence and respect, not even regardless if you're a, a rabbi, a preacher, or a, a, a bishop, <laughs> whatever spirituality, it's more of just saying that you've been able to make it this far in life uh, being a, a strong-willed and, and positive person. And I feel like in our short time knowing each other, uh, I've learned a great deal from you. I've, and I hope to say that you have learned not only my sincerity, but the fact that in, in reading and in, in sharing information, it truly is to enlighten and to uplift and to encourage uh, our communities uh, and to fight against the evil that we both hate. 